Now we return to Trinity Church, Wall Street. Marinus Willett is buried here as well as two other key members of the Sons of Liberty, John Lamb and Hercules Mulligan. There's a lot of conspiracy theories about the Freemasons. So if you're a conspiracy theorist uh, fan, and you believe that the Freemasons were behind the American Revolution and we were a secret society hell-bent on ruling the world and you use the American Revolution as an example, the facts do not support that at all. In spring of 2023, members of Huguenot Lodge number 46 were cleaning out our storage unit and we came across several old books dating from the early 1800s. In those books, we recognized some names from street signs in Westchester County in the Bronx. And that really intrigued us. One of the Lodge brothers said, hey, what if George Washington visited our lodge at some point? So we have spent hundreds of hours researching our history and it's been a heck of a journey. We've traveled all through New York State from Buffalo to Manhattan and beyond in search of our secret history. So please join us on this very interesting journey. If you've been following this story since episode three, you know that Sir John Johnson was the Grand Master Mason of New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania. And that means that he was the head guy. During 1777, when this battle was taking place, there's nothing that destroys the conspiracy theory better than this story here of the Siege of Fort Stanwix. Because on one side we had Nicholas Herkimer. He was a member of St. Patrick's Lodge. So was James Gregg serving under Peter Gainsfort. Peter Gainsfort was a member of Union Lodge number one. Now Union Lodge number one was the mother lodge of John Butler and Sir William Johnson, Sir John Johnson's father. Sir John Johnson and John Butler were members of St. Patrick's Lodge in Johnstown, as was James Gregg who was serving here, and Nicholas Herkimer. So this was Lodge Brother against Lodge Brother. So was there a secret society behind the American Revolution? You bet there was. It was called the Sons of Liberty. This is Francois Tavern in Lower New York City on Pearl Street. Many people know this as the place where General George Washington bid farewell to his officers after the American Revolution. This was originally a home, and the person who built it was Etienne Delancey, or Stephen Delancey, who happened to be Westchester Lodge Number 46's Oliver Delancey's grandfather. So Marianus Willett was not a Freemason. However, he was a key member of the Sons of Liberty in New York and he played a very large role in the American Revolution long before the Siege of Quebec even started. During the Siege of Boston, there were several carriages coming down this way and they were loaded with supplies and weapons. And they were headed toward the British troops in Boston, down toward the port to load up the ship Asia. Marinus Willett saw this caravan. He stood in front of it and he stopped it. On Broadway between Vesey and Fulton is St. Paul's Chapel. This was built for the parishioners of Trinity Church Wall Street who live a little further north in the city. Within this building is the first known rendition of both the Great Seal of the United States as well as the Seal of New York State. Well, this stands in the shadow of the Freedom Tower. Now, if you remember the story about Captain John McKinstry and Joseph Brandt, which we covered in a prior episode, you'll remember that uh, John McKinstry served under Major General Richard Montgomery at the Siege of Quebec. Now, Marinus Willett also served under General Richard Montgomery at the Siege of Quebec. Now, Richard Montgomery is buried here in St. Paul's Chapel. His grave is right behind me, and he was married to none other than Janet Livingston, the sister of Chancellor Robert R. Livingston. So we are at the West Point Foundry Preserve. This is located in Cold Spring, New York, in Putnam County. Right behind us, right across this little body of water, is Constitution Island. Now this is where Marinus Willett and the 3rd New York Regiment uh, was assembled and stationed prior to Fort Stanwix. They drew troops from Putnam County, Orange County, Dutchess County, all the surrounding counties, including Ulster. Several of them were Masons, and they were made Masons in various lodges throughout the state. Uh, there were a number from Independent Royal Arch Number Two in Manhattan, all the way up to St. Patrick's Lodge Number Eight in Johnstown. Now, Marianus Willett and his troops were engaged in battle in a skirmish in March of 1777, prior to their march to Fort Stanwix. Now this happened in Peekskill, New York, which is south of us. Within that skirmish, they actually confiscated a blue coat. And this blue coat which would play a role later in the Fort Stanwix story. Directly across the river is West Point. 
This was a very strategic point on the Hudson River because of its bend and narrowing. We are on McDougal Street in the village. This is named after General Alexander McDougal. Now both General Alexander McDougal and Marianus Willett were key members of the Sons of Liberty in New York and played important roles before the American Revolution. Alexander McDougal was also in command of the Patriot stores in the Peekskill, New York area. And it was under his command that Marianus Willett had his skirmish with the British and confiscated that blue coat. Militia was so badly mauled after the Battle of Risk, and even though that by the 18th century standards uh, they held the field of battle, so they were the winners, but they were so badly mauled by the ambush that they could not continue on, so they just picked up as much of the wounded as they could and returned back to their homes in the valley. Gainsfort uh, sent Marinus Willett to Albany to advise Philip Schuyler what was going on at the fort and ask for reinforcements. They escaped through uh, marshy land just like this. It was swamp. This is actually the Cicero Swamp. It's, it's about 30 miles away from Fort Stanwyck, so it's probably pretty close to what it was like back then. So Willett and Stockwell left the fort at 10 p.m. at night during a howling storm. It took them about two days to reach Fort Dayton. There they ran into the one who must not be named. Now Benedict Arnold really provided the, the uh, last uh, excuse that the Indians supporting the British here during the siege were looking for to now begin leaving the British. They were already going quite disenchanted with how long the siege was taking, the inability of the British to do much to force the Americans or to even consider thinking about uh, giving up. Uh, it had become clear to them very early on the British had not come with the stuff, they, the right stuff, I guess you want to say, to take the fort quickly. Uh, but it also looked like they, they wanted a good excuse, you know, to kind of, I suppose, kind of save face with the British as well. So when Arnold pulled his little ruse of sending a captured Royalist soldier into the Indian lines with the story that he was coming with all these hundreds of thousands of soldiers. Whether or not they completely believed that uh, wasn't as important as the fact that it gave them the excuse they were looking for and now they could go to St. Ledger and say, look, this hasn't been working the way we uh, you told us it would be working. You know, if you want to go back to Canada, get the right stuff and come back, we'll support you then. But if you're just going to continue to sit here to wait and see if the place is going to surrender, we're not, so we're going to leave. And by the way, Arnold's coming with all these men besides. If you want to stick around and see how many men he's actually got, great, but we're out of here. This body of water behind me used to be Wood Creek, and it's now part of the New York State Barge Canal System. This part of the Barge Canal System is in Sylvan Beach. It's right next to a very vintage, nostalgic amusement park, and also a nice little beach that people will spend some time at in the summertime. The Barge Canal System runs from Albany to Buffalo. Now, Barry St. Ledger did not have the canal. No one at that time did. This is Oneida Lake. Back in the 18th century, this was the gateway to the west. Once you left Wood Creek, you cross Oneida Lake, and you get to the Oswego River, which would then take you up to Lake Ontario. From Lake Ontario, you could pretty much go anywhere you wanted. You could go up the St. Lawrence Seaway to Montreal. Now, this is the route that Barry St. Ledger took. Now this lake is very wide, it's about five miles wide and it's much longer, it's about 33 miles long. It's also very shallow, which makes it an extremely dangerous lake to be on when the weather turns rough. A little wind and those waves kick up pretty fast, and trust me, I've been out there when it has. Now Barry St. Ledger was chased from Fort Stanwix when he was retreating, and the troops caught up to him right around here and they saw him off into the sunset uh, getting away and they knew it was just too late. We are on the waterfront of the Hudson River in Peekskill, New York. Behind me is the Hudson River. A few miles north is West Point and Constitution Island. This is where Marinus Willett had his skirmish with the British that he confiscated that blue coat. Now, Marinus Willett was in the Sons of Liberty as we know. Now the Sons of Liberty would erect what were called Liberty Poles in protest of British policies. On top of these poles they would put a Phrygian cap 
and they would also hang this flag here. Most Americans will recognize the red and white stripes. These are distinctly different from the American flags. The stripes run up and down instead of horizontally, and there's absolutely no blue on them. However, you can see where this was going. So one of the units that arrived here to reinforce Fort Stanwix brought news that the Continental Congress had adopted a resolution uh, defining what the American flag should look like. Uh, one of the stipulations was that it was of red, white, and blue colors. So we don't exactly know how this looked, but the garrison here constructed their own flag. They took a white ammunition shirt, they took a red woman's petticoat, and they also took the very blue jacket that Colonel Marianus Willett and his troops had seized down in Peekskill, New York, and they made one of the first American flags to fly during a battle, and it flew here for pretty much the entire duration of Barry St. Ledger and John Johnson's siege. As American Freemasons, we're quite proud of the fact that George Washington, Ben Franklin, Robert Livingston, Paul Revere, we had so many Freemasons who were among our founding fathers, but not all of them were. Now, there were Masons on both sides, and there's a good argument to be made that uh, the philosophical underpinnings of Freemasonry, that Enlightenment philosophy that it's infused with, also permeates throughout the foundation of this great country here. One of the foundational philosophies of the American American Revolution was the fact that the common man could rise to become a leader of nations. Total rebuke of the old feudal system that Europe had perpetuated for centuries and the fact that a person could only take a leadership role by birthright. It was a complete rejection of that and that is uh, well versed within the words of Thomas Paine's common sense. And this concept is at the core of Freemasonry itself. Uh, anyone could walk into a lodge and become master at some point, and they could even become Grand Master Mason uh, of any state here in the, in the country. This is very true, even in the foundation of Westchester Lodge 46, because their first master was Gideon Cogswell, and he was none other than a tradesman. Clearly, the founding members of Westchester Lodge 46 embraced this concept. They included uh, Pels, Bartos, Fowlers, and obviously Delancey as well. Uh, these were uh, some of the wealthiest and most powerful families in early New York State history. And not only was he their first master, he held that position multiple times, which means they really valued him as a person. And how American is that? This Fort Stanwix was built in the uh, 1970s. Uh, th this whole property had been built over through the years. They did extensive archaeological studies and they were able to recreate this fort. It's a phenomenal place to come and visit. I just want to personally thank everyone at Fort Stanwix National Monument. Uh, the crew there is just phenomenal. They are so knowledgeable and helpful. I, I really appreciate all the help in making these films. And if you do come to Rome to visit Fort Stanwix, be sure that you check out the Tomb of the Unknown Revolutionary War Soldier. Now it doesn't have the fancy ceremony that the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier does in DC, but it is no less historic and solemn a place to visit.